Hello and welcome to the chat room on CGTN. I'm Zhou Yun. The chat room is a special online live show which invites people from different countries and backgrounds to share their thoughts and experiences on a particular topic. And today we're joined by guests from around the world and also we're joined by a special guest. So how are you? Let's welcome him. Hello there, Xiao Mo. Hi, I'm Xiao Mo, CGTN official panda. I heard that many friends will come here to talk about different things every week. I'm so excited to be here. Wow, you have sure kept yourself updated to that. So what else do you know? Tell us. Hmm, I also know the show also published on CGTN app and other social platforms such as Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Weibo. Mm -hmm. So do join us and leave the comments and questions. Wow, you're such a smart panda. You're very knowledgeable. Let me ask you something, something a little bit challenging. We know in October or in mid-October, there's a very special day. Do you know what it is? It? Mm, ah, I guess you are referring to the International Day of the Eradication of Poverty on October 17, which is also the 7th National Poverty Relief Day of China. Oh, that's absolutely correct. Well, thank you so much, Xiaomo, for joining us. We're so happy to see you. And just as Xiaomo said, today we have guests from, um, you know, different parts of the world. And they have one thing in common, which is they have experiences in working or volunteering in projects that are relevant with poverty eradication. And it is our great honor to have them. And first thing first, let's have in them introduce themselves a little bit to our viewers. So first of all, let's have uh, Professor Larkin, please. Hello, uh, my name is Robert Larkin. I'm a professor at Huajong Agricultural University in Wuhan, um, and I live and work here full time. Oh, thank you for joining us, Professor. And let's go to Dr. Xia. Uh, sorry, you need to unmute yourself, Doctor. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. sorry. My Chinese name is Xia Haike. My German name is Eckhard Schafschwert. Mm -hmm. From 2000 to 2016, I lived in China, Yunnan province, in the countryside. And my main task was helping the Chinese government upgrading medical services at the three lowest level, county, township, and village. Mm -hmm. And on the side, I did English teaching and some poverty alleviation projects. In remote village. Okay, thank you so much for joining us, doctor. Welcome to the show. Let's go to Mr. Hansen. Hello there, sir. How are you today? Uh, good, e good evening. My name is Nico Hansen. I'm from Luxembourg. I'm a retired policeman. Since uh, 2018, I joined the party as a volunteer on poverty elevation. Mm -hmm. I work in uh, Guangxi province in the Luisanji mountains. The village is called Chandong. Okay. We help the people out of poverty. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. And let's go to the beautiful girl. Xin, uh, so, Xin Qing, you're now in Germany, right? But you used to work in Africa, right? So, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Thank you. Yes, that's right. So, I spent the last two years working in Nairobi, in Africa, for an NGO called Agra. So, my job is to introduce Chinese technology and agriculture for the agriculture um, transformation in Africa. Mm -hmm. So now you are pursuing your studies, right? In Germany, oh, in France, That's actually. Correct. Yes, I'm now reading a master in policy in environment. Okay, wow, that's amazing. Let's go, go to this young and promising uh, young man who's now based in Kenya. So yes, Meng Han, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Liu Yi Meng Han. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Dream Building Service Association, and uh, I'm currently in Nairobi, Kenya, and stayed in Kenya for about 13 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, DBSA mainly focus uh, for the uh, youth empowerment projects, like the feeding program, uh, the Thailand show, uh, the school renovation and scholarship programs. Um, so. Um, I'd like to share more with uh, all of you later. 
Nice yeah, that'd be great. You. We look forward to your sharing a little bit later. And first of all, let's start with Professor Larkin, because I know Professor Yu and also your university is working with some counties and some villages to help the farmers increase their,、uh, you know, payment to help them get out of poverty. And in one village, which are now famous for、um, planting the grapefruit, and many local people, that's what I heard, are treating you as the ambassador of the grapefruit in this village. Is that is that the case? Oh, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm the ambassador. <laughs>、um, hey. I've, I've tried to help promote the program. Our,、mm-hmm. our, my college, the、um, College of Horticulture and Forestry Science, has had a program in、um, Hualong Village, which is in western Hubei Province,、um, in、um, Jianshi County.、Um, and this is a really beautiful place. I visited the. The village twice. It's very mountainous, and historically,、um, there has been problems. My understanding: there have been problems with transportation and information and technology getting into the village,、um, and so this has caused a lot of poverty. My college has advised them on growing the、um, grapefruit you mentioned, the、um, Yu Huang Hualong grapefruit, and I think pear as well. And help them to increase yields fairly substantially, and therefore、um, the money that they can bring in for their crop, and this has raised their standard of living. That's that's one of ex- one example of our、um, poverty alleviation program. Mm-hmm. So, Professor, can you give us like just a few examples about how the difference has been made after you know the、uh, the local farmers since they start or since they're、uh, shifting their plants from you know growing poor crops or growing、uh, you know、uh, corns to now the grapefruit? Is there a big a big difference made in their daily lives and also livelihood? Um, you know, I, I don't really know the specific details on that,、mm-hmm. but my understanding is that the, quen- the answer to your question is more or less yes.、Um, the、um, these cash crops, like in particular this grapefruit, and the higher yields they're now getting, has actually、um, increased their their profit margin and it's increased their standard of living.、Um, exactly.、Um, You know what they've done. I, I'm, I'm、mm-hmm. not all, all the details of what they've done. Yeah, yeah, I understand.、Um, I, I'm not sure. I, I think it's they they they've been able to improve their sanitation, like trash collection, things like this, and some other aspects of their standard of living. But um,、mm-hmm. uh, oh, great, exactly thank you. Exactly all the details on that. I'm not. Yeah, let's go to uh, uh, go to Mr. Henson because I know you have a very interesting story, and you might know more details because you are deeply involved with many、uh, projects in the village that you are currently in. Because I know you first came to China in 2015 just for traveling, right? And there, and then there's something happened later which prompts you to stay here for China for almost three years. So tell us a little bit more about that. So what keeps you here for such a long period of time? That was、uh, I was with my friends just visiting the village,、mm-hmm. and that was outside、uh, of the cities. So when I was coming there, I never imagined to find some villages like hundred years before. And then there were a group of volunteers. They make some construction, and I was looking at them, and then I asked, "What's going on?" And they said, "Yes." We try to plant passion fruit, and then I meet the first secretary, and this changed my whole life. So、mm-hmm. I ask him, "What's what's the matter?" He said, "This is the government、uh, program about poverty elevation, and this、uh, passion fruits they are golden passion fruits." I said, "I have no idea what it is." So, if you need help, you can call me. A few days later, he called me. Will we go back to the mountains and do some jobs?、Mm-hmm. And I joined him, and then these golden passion fruits—they were like my babies. They were so special, and to convince the people、mm-hmm. that this will bring money—that was the most difficult part. Right. So, because I know one thing that has really inspired you to stay in that village is that what you said before is that when you first go to that village, you think the sceneries, you know, the views here are outstanding. 
are, you know, it's gorgeous. But when you walk into a family, the family of a local villager, what you said is you, you find nothing but dire poverty. Is that still the case where after they started planting those uh, passion fruit, things have been changed, the situation? So now when you walk into a family of a local farmer, what do you find? It is still nothing but dire poverty or is something else that you have been, um, you know, witnessing? No, it's a completely different world. If you go now there, we take the car, we have streets. In two years, oh. we built, I don't know how many kilometers of streets, yes? Mm -hmm. Concrete streets, real streets. So, and a lot of the houses have gone. They were very bad houses, smart houses. Now, the government will build new houses, yes? So, you come in, the people are so happy. You are so welcome. Mm -hmm. And to see all this happening. Uh, that's, that's amazing. And all to say this, in two years, we bring uh, electricity, water, we build the streets, new houses, and, and the most important, there is income because of the passion food. Also, now uh, this year, we started with uh, watermelons, also a special uh, fruit. It's yellow uh, watermelons, mm -hmm. very tasty. The yellow watermelon. Wow, that's amazing, huh? But it's, yes. it's, what is also amazing is you used to be a, a police officer before you retire, and, right? And now you're like a farmer, like a local farmer. So do you go to the field very often? Yes. I love, I love to work on, on, uh, on the fields. Mm -hmm. uh, working outside in the fresh nature and to see this, uh, these plants growing. That's uh, so, so much happening. There's nothing uh, for me, farming, farming. That's, I should have done it my whole life. Yeah. And then uh, at the end of the year, if you have the harvest, we're selling the fruits. We see the people who are very, very joyful to buy our fruits. And then to, to, to show the, the farmers, there is income, there's money. What could be more? Uh. That's amazing. And I saw Dr. Zia just keep nodding. That sounds very uh, rewarding to you as well, right, doctor? Yes. yes. It sounds right. like a great project. Well, doctor, I really want to ask you, because I know you've been in China for over 15 years now. We're around 15 years. So tell us a little bit more about your work. And also about? maybe the changes that you have been seeing. Yeah. Within those 15 years, we saw a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. When we first arrived at the hospital, um, there was just one ECG machine, one ultrasound machine. Um, it was a small hospital with three departments. And now, years later, there are several uh, huge buildings. Uh, they keep upgrading uh, medical equipment. Um, the whole province has changed. Um, I mean, infrastructure, uh, transport, traffic, and that's, that has been very impressive. Mm -hmm. And I also want to ask you, because this is also the concern of so many people. We know China has been helping um, over 800, and 800 million people out of poverty in the past, uh, let's say, about 40 years, right? But so many people in the village, they're concerned that if, like, the family were a family member or several family members get sick, like very sick, that kind of disease could plunk the, pe the, the family back again in poverty. So is that kind of your concern as well? So what can we do to help people prevent, you know, big um, challenges and also crises like that? Yes, that has been the case. I rem remember in 2015, mm -hmm. the government did an investigation and sent nurses and doctors up to the villages. They went from house to house uh, to interview them and see how their economic situation is and why some fell into poverty. And the most common uh, cause w was actually disease, which plunged the family into poverty. They came up with um, some measures, and some of them I. I haven't seen in detail since I left the place in 2016. Uh, but yeah, uh, apart from the health insurance, which was introduced in 2006 in Yunnan, there are now special funds for those very poor people. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So I think this uh, relief is helpful, but relief is short lived, and there need to be uh, some uh, more sustainable um, development measures. Right. Thank you, doctor. Let's go to the beautiful lady, Xinqing. So just as you said, you used to be based in uh, Africa, right? And you are in this organization called AGRA, which aims to introduce the uh, the policies, technologies from China to help African countries to um, increase or improve their living standards and also agriculture um, development, right? So so among the projects that you've been doing, so what partic what is particular you know, popular in every country and the lessons that we learned from China that you think are the most impressive? Thanks. So let me maybe first start with introducing a bit about AGRA. So mm -hmm. AGRA itself is an African organization. It has about 200 employees and I'm the only Chinese people. Wow. So actually AGRA is fully African led. It was funded about 14 years ago by the former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. So the goal of AGRA is to promote agriculture transformation in Africa. Maybe many Chinese people wouldn't, um, I mean, today I'm 28 years old and I don't remember what is the feeling to be hungry, mm -hmm. but actually that's the situation in Africa. If agriculture still employs about 60% of the people in sub-Saharan Africa and contributes only 20% of the GDP. So there's a lot to do. And as I mentioned, China was once very poor and we don't have great agriculture output or yield. Um, a very concrete example, rice yield. Um, we maybe know that um, due to Yangping, due to the green rice, green super rice in China, now the average uh, yield of rice in China is about six to seven tons per hectare, but mm -hmm. average in Africa is only one to 1.5. So there's a lot to be improved and to be learned from China. Mm -hmm. My job within the, within the organization is to explore how we can introduce the policy learnings, the experiences, but also products, technology, investment, and public funding from China to help Africa grow the agriculture. And I guess your question was, what is the most common or most promising ones? Right. I think technology or products-wise, there's a lot. We can talk about mechanization, mm -hmm. talk about improved seed varieties. But also, I think the experience and policy are very important. How do we strengthen the institution? How do we promote uh, mechanization, for example? All these is lessons we can learn from China. Mm -hmm. That's great. And well, Xin Ying just mentioned, like, you know, we are like the similar age, right? So we don't even remember the days we are starving. Maybe my parents' generation were, you know, my great grandparents, maybe they have the times, the really hard times, you know, of keeping themselves full. But for our generation, life has become so much better. And but for the kids in Africa, like starving, is one of the key concerns faced by them. And I know that's why maybe uh, Meng Han, so you have initiated this project, which helps you know the young people, the, the very young kids, students, to have the free lunch project. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so basically, why what happens uh, to start, uh, for us to start it, the uh, NGO was, uh, it was, 2014, and I was a sophomore at the uh, Lock University, and I got a chance to visit the second largest uh, slum in Kenya, which is called Mathari. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically a three kilometer uh, square uh, piece of land with about 600 people in population, and the houses will be mostly built uh, with iron sheds with um, uh, with less power supply and with no uh, good water, uh, flowing water uh, in, in the area and cause a lot of disease and hungry issues and many other difficulties. So uh, I, I, I joined as a, uh, volunteers to teach in one of the school and we found that this, the, the condition of the study environment is really, really bad. There is no any lights. Uh, teachers and students are uh, squeezed in about seven to ten meters square room without any light. Wow. And um, we just felt that maybe we could do something. And um, so me and some of my friends who are also university students, we started to do the fundraising mm -hmm. uh, in, in China, which is crowdfunding. We funded about 80, 80 um, 
80,000 Chinese yuan, and we have renovated that school with concrete and bricks uh, with some good light coming in. So then we, we see a really big difference uh, that students will be having a better uh, study environment. But then the problem comes afterwards. Um, there is a lot of students, uh, you would see them dropping out of school because they may not have enough, uh, the family may not have enough money. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, because or with other diff uh, different reasons. So then we, uh, we, we started um, expanding our projects uh, by providing some uh, art trainings and the feeding program as well. Uh, to, be, uh, to elaborate more on the feeding program, uh, basically we'll work with the schools whereby uh, we'll partly uh, we'll be providing breakfast and lunch in mm -hmm. school. As long as there is a school day, there will be, uh, there will be the feeding program and students will be able to be facilitated to come to school and study uh, because there is one to two meals a day and it will reduce the pressure from the, from the families. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we, we, we could see a, quite some difference from this uh, starting till now. It's now three years in the feeding program has, and we have covered in about um, six African countries. Before the before the pandemic, because after the pandemic, a lot of school has been closed, suspended due to mm -hmm. the pandemic. Right. So, um, um, just given an example of Channel Light Center, one of the school that we have renovated, um, it used to have about 200 students, and now it has. Uh, after the expansion and the feeding program, it has a better teaching environment, better structure, and also the student has increased to 430 six students so we did see some improvement uh, improvements through the projects that's great and i heard uh you know you not only you know, been helping them to provide food you also have been teaching them mandarin so how is it going are they learning really fast are you a good teacher on that front um <laughs> okay so uh when i was uh, a volunteer teacher by then uh mostly i teach the basic curriculum classes so apart from those classes, the student always ask me because they know I'm a Chinese and they've been seeing more and more Chinese in, in Africa. So they asked me to teach them um, some Mandarin and um, they are really, really, really fast learner because um, when they're born, they're able to speak one of their mother tongue, which is mm -hmm. the native language. Mm -hmm. They're able to speak the national language, which is Swahili. Right. And they're able to speak English. So they're really talented in the language um, uh, studies. And I really felt that they're really, really fast in, in, in studying Chinese as well. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in, in terms of uh, Belt and Road, we know that the, um, the, the Belt and Road Initiative happens a lot in, in African countries, and there might be more opportunities uh, for people to join uh, partially with uh, the Chinese companies and all that. So um, our future plan was to have a kind of vocational training center whereby to empower the local teenagers or the young people, uh, providing with them uh, free or with a very little charge of vocational training and try and link them uh, with the Chinese companies, especially the uh, construction uh, companies in the future. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's, that's great. And also another question I wanted to ask all of you is that because in terms of speaking of, um, you know, poverty alleviation, people have different opinions about the challenges. Some, they, uh, some people say the priority is to build a road because we have a saying in China, if you want to get rich, you have to, to build a road first, right? So many say infrastructure is the key. And there are other people say, that, you know, you know the, the education level, the villagers are more important. And there are also other uh, you know, concerns and also there are other challenges. So I want to ask uh, all of the guests here today who have been involved in many uh, poverty alleviation projects. So for you, what do you think that really stands out in terms of helping people to get rid of poverty? Is it infrastructure? Is it about education? Or is it about something else? Let's go to Professor Larkin first. So Professor, what do you think are the most important thing uh, in this process? Um, well, I think all of the points you um, touched on there are important. I, it's hard to really um, find one that's in, more important than the other, but um, my uni uh, 
the poverty allevi alleviation programs that are run by um, Hwajong Agricultural University focus on education, teaching um, you know, farmers in poor villages how to um, better grow their crops um, and so on and increase yields and, their, and therefore bringing greater income. Um, so um, my impression um, is that there's still, um, there's still work to be done in this area. Mm -hmm. um, and um, these sorts of programs can have a, a major impact on poverty alleviation. That's what I observed in um, Holong Village. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, Right. Um, yeah, that, that's that's good to know. Let's let's go to yeah, Doctor. Uh, yeah, Professor. If you have more to add, yeah, we can go back to you a little bit later. Let's go to uh, Mr. Henson, because uh, many say you know you can't just plant fruits or vegetables or something in there. You need to sell them. And now it seems like in recent years, one thing that's become so popular here in China is e-commerce, right? People start to sell stuff online. And even many farmers, they are now become really big influencers online trying to sell, you know, the, the fruits, the vegetables that they right. grow on their fields. So is there something that you have been seeing in the village that you stay, you know, the combination of new technology into uh, their marketing and also the sales of the products or the uh, agricultural products that they grow? You know, everything is important. Education is important. Healthcare mm -hmm. is important. But all this, if you don't have the streets, right. where to start? The people want electricity. How to bring the electricity if you don't have streets? The farming pro our farming products, how to bring it to the market if you don't have streets? Mm -hmm. So that's what before. The people didn't produce so much. Why? Where to give? If you have too much, there are no streets, just right. only small paths on the mountains. You need one day to go to the city. So, building the streets, mm -hmm. then you can continue with all the others. Also for the for the schools. Now we also have uh, schools, but if there is a street, you can build a, a school. It's very easy to build a, a school if you have a street. Mm -hmm. So the streets for me is the most important. All your dreams you have, if you don't have streets, where to start? Great. So infrastructure, especially roads, you think are the top priority, right? So uh, let's let's go to Dr. Yes. Xia. Do you agree? Yes. Dr. Xia, do you think roads and infrastructure are the most important thing? Or no, as a doctor, you think still medical care, um, you know, medical care and people's health is still comes in the first place? I think all these are important. Um, but in the end, I think you cannot change a person from the outside. Uh, change must come from inside. Um, mm -hmm. There, there need to be a change of of your heart, and then um, new attitudes evolve, and out of these new attitudes, there uh, becomes new behavior. Um, mm -hmm. I think in education and encouragement and in my case living in china personal example um all helps uh, but um, personally i believe um there, there must be uh, love and for me personally that uh, it's only god who really can change a heart from the inside out well, doctor, personally, what was challenging for you, especially when you first came to China? Is it about the language? Is it, is it about people's trust of doctors? Or is it about something else? Can you share with us a little bit? Yeah. Um, when I arrived in China, um, I started learning Chinese with 36 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, then, so I had much more difficulties than my small children who just picked it up in kindergarten. Um, studying Chinese was more difficult than studying medicine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, dealing with officials, when I was in Germany, I was just a small doctor at the hospital, but then suddenly in China, in the little town, I became a VIP, and you have to have official dinners, drink a lot of alcohol, and in those days, um, that was quite challenging learning how to 
negotiate um, new projects um, and then trying to um, bring change to the hospital needed lots of patience, lots of patience, slowly, mm -hmm. slowly picking up um, how you can encourage uh, people with your own example. Um, that takes a lot of time. Right. Um, and many other things which are challenging. And each year we need a new visa, and every time we are very anxious, will we get an extension for another year? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Altogether, we enjoyed it very much. We loved the food. Um, there were so, so many good friendships evolved over time um, that it was very, very hard to leave. That's good to know. Let's go to Xinqing because I noticed in the article that has uh, that you know interviewed you, you mentioned that partnership and patience are important in developing agricultural projects. Do you think that's still the key where you have changed your mind? Yes, I still think, especially partnership. Maybe I want to mention two types of partnerships. Mm -hmm. The first one is partnership between the public sector and private sector. So I think a lot of challenges I have encountered in Africa is actually the local government's capacity. There's a lot of corruption. There's also technical, um, technical capacity. If you want to pursue poverty alleviation sustainably for the long term, I think public sector is very important, but they also need to work with the local private sector. You need to um, promote more entrepreneurship. Actually, all the farmers, they are all entrepreneurs. They make decisions, they need to invest in the agricultural inputs, and then they need to sell. So they're already actually entrepreneurs. You just need to enable them. Mm -hmm. This is the first partnership. And the second, I think very important, is international cooperation. China is really leading in global, in promoting multi multilateralism and global leadership. I think in Africa, a lot of governments need also uh, to work more with, for example, um, global um, organizations, international organizations like World Bank, but also maybe with Chinese investment, Chinese government. So this is the second partnership I think is very important. Right, the two partnership, which are very important. Let's go to uh, Meng Han because Meng Han just says, uh, Xin Jing said, you know, in, uh, you know, international cooperation is important, and also Mr. Hansen say, uh, infrastructure infrastructure is important. So if we combine the two, we'll we'll just realize, you know, infrastructure in international cooperation might also be important. And if we put that question into a context, we have to. You know, we can't uh, men we can leave this question without mentioning the Belt and Road Initiative, which, which you have actually previously mentioned before. So you have been in Africa for over a decade now. So after this initiative was carried out, have you ever seen the uh, infrastructure that's been building in Africa with the help of China and now is actually getting bigger and stronger? Oh, sorry, Monghan, you need to unmute yourself. I'm so sorry. Sorry. Okay, now it's good. Okay, all right. Yep. Uh, just as uh, Xinqing and the doctor has mentioned, uh, one is on the uh, uh, national, uh, like, countries' cooperation, and the other direction is the uh, infrastructure. I believe these two are the directions that um, that the big entity wants to move. And on our side, what we can do will probably um, to see how to improve the um, the capabilities of the people in the nation. Mm -hmm. So, well, we, we just try our best. As um, as th there's an old saying in, in Chinese that um, So basically it means that uh, if you wanted to, you would rather um, teach someone how to do the fishing instead of giving rather them the than fish. just give them right yeah just to give them well the, you have the lived fish. in africa so for like 13 is, years but you you're chinese you, you're still very familiar with the chinese culture right and the chinese language bravo good for you yeah. <laughs> thank you so much thank mm -hmm. you so much <laughs> yeah as I, I i believe that uh i'm, I'm really far from my country mm -hmm. but i got more um, Curiosity. I got more curiosity about the Chinese culture, and I tend to learn a lot okay, uh, regarding to know. that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, so regarding to the, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. please continue. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so um, what, what what we wanted to do is try and achieve as sustainable as possible. 
as we move this uh, step forward. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. And actually, we've been talking for more than half an hour now. And how about let's invite our special guest back to see how is he feeling about our dialogue? Hello there, Samu. Are you with us now? Hi. Wow, what a raging dialogue. And I'm so impressed with what the guests have done, mm -hmm. especially the volunteer working NGO in Africa. I'm so glad that children can have better education and better infrastructure. Wow, and the challenges the guests have been faced. Wow, awesome. I do admire what you have done. Great job. It is really great job. You know, they have done a marvelous job, I think, in helping people in different sectors and also especially to help people get out of the poverty. And Xiaomu, thank you so much. I think, yeah, you have been enjoying our dialogue. So we'll be go back to, we'll be go back to you um, at the end of the show. Okay, so stay with us. So isn't that just amazing? Well, let's go back to our discussion because I want to ask uh, Professor Larkin. Because I know, Professor, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, because marketing for farmers now are also important because they, for them, they not only need to, to plant those uh, products, right? They also need to sell it. So for selling them, the roads, they have to have the channels. The roads are important, but they have to have the channels as well. And I know as a, col a professor from college, sometimes you actually train you know, the local farmers with local officials about marketing, better marketing about their products. Can you, so can you share a little bit experience uh, with us on that front? Like how can we help or better help the farmers to sell their products? Right. Um, well, I actually haven't been involved in any of the marketing, to be honest. Um, but yeah, that, that's actually a very important point. And I think there are a variety of options now in addition to the the traditional um, brick and mortar stores. There are many online options, I would imagine, but um, my role in that has not involved marketing. I, I think you're correct about, um, in addition to teaching people how to grow crops and get high yields, the roads are tremendously important. I did go, um, I visited a village in um, Guizhou province mm -hmm. um, that it, I think it was uh, Bijia, um, it was more education related and not so much um, um, more academic. More right, right, right. Um, but you can tell us about your education, education the experiences. Long, but to get there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, like you can Sorry? share with this with uh, you can share a little bit with us about your education uh, experience with the farmers or with local officials. Like, what kind of lessons do we usually teach them? What kind of lessons do you think that are important for them to improve their livelihoods? Right. Okay. So I, I haven't really been involved in that. Um, I was going to talk about the importance of roads, and um, I, I have experienced this, this um, going to a poor village mm -hmm. that we could not reach on a modern road. And I think it was Nico Hansen was talking about this earlier. Yes, it's really critical. I've experienced that myself. These, there are still some poor quality roads, and so having transportation to move products in and out is tremendously important. But... Um, so the actual education um, <clears throat> that uh, my university is in, that Hojong Agricultural University done, hasn't been done specifically by me, but rather the citrus experts at our university. There's a tremendous amount of expertise here on, um, on citrus. So there's a lot of research being done both on developing new varieties of crops and cultivation and so on. And it's these experts who have really um, <clears throat> taught the villagers in, in, in Hualong Village how to improve their yields and so on, and um, marketing as well, I presume. But I, I haven't been in, in directly involved in the marketing mm -hmm. aspect of the program. Yeah, I think that's Sorry, fine. I can't help you no, there. no, no problem. But still, thank you so much for your answer. Let's go back to Dr. Xia, because Doctor, you've been here in China for 15 years, and you've been treating many local patients from the villages. And and as we know, we're now the entire world is now facing a very serious COVID-19 virus. It's like a very very serious outbreak. So so many people are worried about this pandemic, and now we're also approaching the flu season. So people are even more concerned, right? So from the perspective of a medical expert, are you concerned about the, uh, the people, especially low-comp people, you know, about their health condition, about the challenges that they might face? And do you have some suggestions for them? Um, in respect to Corona, 
I think China is doing uh, great, much better than we in Europe. So I think we cannot really give advice mm -hmm. to that. Um, but other healthcare problems I observe. Um, right. There are many, many in our mountainous areas in Yunnan, there are many, many motorbike accidents. Uh, people not wearing helmets, um, drinking alcohol, and then uh, going on the road. Um, that is really sad. And these are of young boys, young families, young couples, or uh, young parents. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing. But then with with China's development and um, everyone buying cars and eating better or eating more, um, the problem of overweight in children, um, the lifestyle diseases we've been facing in Europe for, for many decades already, they're all arriving in China and they're even arriving in the villages. Mm -hmm. and so I, I think there need to be, um, from primary school onwards, there need to be education and uh, measures on how mm -hmm. to live healthier. Um, right. They'll have enough um, exercise, physical exercise, how to eat healthier. Otherwise, this um, will be a huge economic burden on China. Mm. Everyone living longer with chronic diseases. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, Doctor, let's talk a little bit about the future. That's also the question that I want to ask uh, the rest of our guests. So you've been here in China for 15 years. So what is your plan for the next year and maybe even the upcoming five years? What kind of work do you want to do the most to further help people to lead a better life here? Do you have a vision, something like that? Mm -hmm. I, I've actually returned to Germany after 15, 16 years. Um, mm -hmm. four years ago mm -hmm. and working as a doctor now in Germany uh, but um, apart from this year um, where you can't go back to China I've been back twice a year and um, each year I'm guiding a travel tour of young people uh, to show them how China is developing to show them the beauty but, but also the modern aspects of it. Uh, countryside to bring them into contact with my friends in the rural areas. And the other uh, part is uh, still being invited to teach uh, medical courses. Um, I, I mainly teach now, nowadays um, how to rescue newborns um, if they don't do well um, after delivery. And I do hope that after Corona we can continue uh, mm -hmm. teaching as I see myself more as a multiplier. As a doctor, I can treat 100 patients, but if I work as a teacher, I can help 100 doctors to become better doctors and then bless their own people. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you so much, doctor. Let's go back to Mr. Hansen. Well, Mr. Hansen, I know they are now you are not only helping local people to produce the uh, passion fruit, you actually have the plan to work with local officials to help the local farmers to fully unleash the aquatourism, if what, that's what we call. Is that correct? Tell us a little bit about that plan. So, Mr. Hansen, are you still with us? About what? Oh, Sorry. about because I I heard if yes. I heard uh, correctly I heard now you are not only helping people local you know the local farmers to produce uh, passion fruit you also have the plan to work with local officials yes. to boost the this the industry of ecotourism. So yeah, show us a little bit on that if I'm right, if I did my yes, homework yes, right. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's my idea. That's my idea. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the peasants, they, they have the passion fruits and uh, they have also other, other, other fruits and vegetables. But there should be more now because for me, the location is very beautiful. So I will, uh, we make uh, ecological, biological fruits. They are very healthy. That's what the doctor said. 
this is nothing you can buy in the supermarket, what we have. So I will have the same for tourism, uh, ecotourism. I will have little groups of people, uh, people who love the nature, maybe who want to help uh, the farmers to work on the fields. That's something I will promote. Mm -hmm. Do you think not only here, people here in China, but also maybe people from other parts of the world, like we're from Luxembourg, do you think they will be interested and attractive to come to a village like the one that you're in to, you know, to, to take a side, to, to sightseeing and also to, to do their, um, yes. to, to enjoy their holiday? So w why? What, what is so it's special not. about the village? That, that you're staying? If now you're the ambassador of that uh, tourism project, which are you interested in, what would you tell them to come to China and to, to see them, you know, to buy themselves? You know, I was growing up in, uh, growing in, in, in Europe. You have mm -hmm. a, a different vision about China. Right. You only understand China if you live here. It's very, it's very, very hard. It's complicated, but you cannot talk if you do not live here. If you just come as a tourist, you just see see, see these uh, beautiful buildings, the monuments, and all this. But living on the countryside, that's something that will be unforgettable. And it's healthy. You get uh, healthy food. The uh, environment is very healthy. So. That's okay for for holidays. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So next time when you know those foreign guests they want to visit China, maybe they're not only interested to go to see an, the Great Wall or the Forbidden City. Maybe they're interested to go to the village that you are in and you've been promoting, and that would be a big success, right? Yes. Yes. Oh, that's great. I, I really. Oh, no, we have the streets. We can. Mm -hmm. You have the roads, and people can actually go no, there, we have the streets. right? We they, they don't need to climb the mountains yes, and to yes. get there. It's very convenient and right, accessible to go there. Yes. And also what they said for, for the doctors, if you, uh, in this uh, village is far away, you broke, you broke your legs. How will they bring you to the hospital to it's all? Yes. On the back, two people We can, ha we can send Dr. Xia to there to save leg. them, right? We can send them. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. Yeah, but I yeah I gotta admit. Yes, but now. Now we have the street. Mm -hmm. We take a car. We take the people in the car. Bring them to the hospital. Right, right. That's right. that's amazing. That's amazing and brilliant. Let's go go back to Xinqing because Xinqing you are now pursuing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Henson. Let's go back to Xinqing, because Xinqing, I know you're now pursuing your master uh, degree, which majoring in uh, public public policy, as you just said, right? And I'm so sorry that, you know, it's a hard time for students now, because most of the courses are done through e-learning, right? But still, what is your plan after you graduate? Do you still plan to go back to the, you know, African, uh, sorry, I mean, agriculture uh, fronts where you're going to switch your career or industry a little bit? Thanks. That's a really good question. So actually, I'm studying environmental policy, mm -hmm. a lot regarding to climate change. I'm pursuing this particular field exactly because I feel there is a connection between agriculture and environment. One thing I personally experienced in Mozambique that changed my view is that I think one year ago, there was a cyclone called Idai that happened in the southern part of Africa, in Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Malawi, that killed hundreds of people. And more importantly, it really ruined the agricultural harvest of that year. Mm -hmm. For one year, we've been working in Mozambique, but then we saw the cyclone coming in and ruin everything we have been planting, the rice and everything. So that made, made me feel that climate change is actually really important to if we want to secure the food security in Africa. That's why after my master's degree in environmental policy, I want to work in the intersection between agriculture and climate change in Africa. That's what I want to do. Wow, that's very, very promising. Thank you so much, Xinjing. Let's finally go to uh, 
Mohan, okay, okay, now you're so prepared, right? You know what I'm asking, but I'm going to ask you something a little bit different. Okay, I'm so sorry for the surprises. But yes, I know you've been, just as I said, you've been helping local people, the local students to, with your, you know, lunch meal, and also you've been teaching them Mandarin. So I assume that your future vision is still relevant with China, either the Chinese culture, where you want to help young people maybe in the future to, to even visit China or have the experience, have the opportunity to, to work in China. Is that is that the is that what you have been uh, imagined? Or what what is your plan for the future? Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry for actually, such a tough question. It's hard, no, it's uh, it's it's a hard question. Actually, uh, I've always been thinking about it, and I, I didn't really found an answer uh, because right now we, we know that after the pandemic, a lot of things has been uh, very slow, mm-hmm. also on our sides. So um, what we are currently doing is to review what we have done and see what we can improve. And um, uh, also, I was not, uh, I didn't start with the uh, NGO profession in the, in the universities. So I really wanted to see if I could get a chance to have a further studies regarding to this topic. And it would be perfect, but I really don't know if I, I'm going to uh, get the chance of having this opportunity. Um, uh, but generally speaking, um, we, we, we definitely want our NGO to be on a different level, uh, to be a more international level. Um, mm-hmm. Also could represent uh, China and give a good image to the uh, rest, of, uh, rest of the world. Because as we know, um, uh, relatively uh, Chinese NGOs are fewer, like there's not so many uh, Chinese NGOs in in, uh, in, in the worldwide. And um, China is having getting getting more reputation. And I think it's a good time to achieve this. Mm-hmm. And we'll try our best. Okay, yeah. And wish you the best of luck. So, and finally, because we have a tradition in our show is like usually we allow, um, you know, guests asking each other question, questions of their top concern, uh, questions that interest in. But today we're running out of time. So I'll just give one person an opportunity to ask the question to any guest that, you know, that present today about something that he or she is interested in because uh, Xinqing is the only lady in the guest panel. So I would like to give this opportunity to you, Xinqing. So is there something that you really want to ask the other guest, something that really, you know, concerns you or something that you are interested, please feel free to go ahead. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to go first. Um, actually, my question will be to Menghan. Menghan, we were friends in Nairobi for a long time. I know you very well. Mm, but my question to you is, after I left Nairobi and then COVID happened in, in, in Kenya and in Africa, so what did you do uh, uh, in, in, in the face of COVID? And then and you mentioned also a lot of the kids, they cannot go back to school anymore. So how did you deal with that after the COVID? Um, okay, thank you so much for sending our uh, question. And um, yeah, uh, regarding to this question, um, uh, the, the, the pandemic happened in Africa at about mid of, mid of March. And all the schools, government and private schools, has been suspended from then. So, uh, and a lot of because the economic economics is down, and not a lot of people are able to uh, get their job which they're used to work. So there was actually a big problem, especially in the slums. So uh, after the investigation, we decided uh, to produce a food package whereby it includes some maize flour, some green grains, some uh, rice uh, as a food package to deliver to the families who used to have, uh, have the feeding program, at least to reduce their pressure. And on the other side, we also uh, started the fundraising uh, in China to, do the, uh, to continue with the food package. Um, so, uh, but, but, but for an international tra- transaction, it takes a long time. So we, we, we haven't uh, gone it so wide, but we, we've just started in few schools right now. But very, very soon, in about one to two weeks' time, we'll be having our uh, food package officially started. Mm-hmm. So, Xinqing, are you happy about the answer that Mohan just gave it? I'm very happy and I wish you good luck. I yeah. hope one day I can come back to Nairobi and help you with that also. Thank you so much. It would be so good. Thank okay. you.
Thank you so much. And before we wrap up, how about let's invite our special guest back to the show? Hello there, Xiaomo. Are you with us again? How have been feeling right now? You're happy? Are you enjoying Hi. our dialogue? Yeah, I really enjoy the dialogue, and I'm time to expect and time to hit the road to see things with my own eyes. Well, actually, speaking I'm so of excited. Hit, I'm excited too. Well, speaking of hitting the road, actually, me myself is going to a village in South Wai China, Sichuan Province, later this week. So, me will get the chance to see it with my own eyes, and from there, me and my colleagues will bring you live coverage about how the local people have been lifted out of poverty and also paved the way for the Xiao Kang society. So, please stay tuned with us, okay? Wow, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to share. And also, Sichuan's your hometown, right? Yeah, absolutely.、That's、wow,、amazing. I miss my hometown. Okay, I would go and I would see you. Yeah, I really expect to see you. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Xiao Mo, for joining us this time, and also a big thank you to all the guests today for sharing with us your、uh, their personal stories and experiences in poverty alleviation, and also a big thank you to our followers on various social platforms. Have more to come in the following weeks, and thank you. Bye for now.